<laughs> so last time your boss was in the train. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm in the car. <laughs> That's okay. So Alexander, uh, are you fine? Yes, How are you? Yeah, thank you, thank you. Thank you Hello, very much Professor for Professor Kato. Nice today. to see you. Very Hello, nice Professor you. Cargioso. Hello. Yeah, a pleasure Hello, meeting everybody. you. Great. You look very nice. <laughs> thank you. We are so happy to see your face. Happy. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Okay. Yes, uh, shall we start, Professor? Yes, I think so. Yes, okay. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining this uh, ACNS uh, YNS uh, meeting. And uh, and uh, today uh, we'll, we'll have uh, two uh, speakers. And uh, the first uh, speaker is uh, Professor uh, Kostandin, uh, who will be uh, sharing, sharing uh, the topic of the expectations from shunting in the INPH, the current understanding. And for the second session will be our, our YNS speaker, Dr. Ann um, Manshu, who will be uh, sharing on the topic of the minimal invasive techniques for getting somatic mutations in vascular malformations and their targeted therapeutic uh, options. Uh, today uh, with us um, uh, will be the uh, Professor Alberto, uh, who will be the chairperson of this uh, session. And uh, alongside with us uh, will be uh, uh, Professor uh, Oli Seng, uh, who who will be, and also the and also the uh, professor Ahiba, uh, and who will be uh, uh, joining us uh, as uh, as uh, our uh, our panel our panelist. So uh, maybe uh, shall I hand over to our uh, professor Alberto, who will chair the session to introduce our first uh, speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Ben. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to, to be here and uh, to chair this uh, uh, session. Uh, I think we have uh, two uh, very, very interesting topics today. Uh, so the first uh, speaker is Professor Konstantin Karagiozov. Uh, he is a professor of neurosurgery at the uh, GK University School of Medicine, Japan. And uh, his uh, talk is about uh, expectations from shunting in uh, uh, idiopathic NPH, the current understanding. Uh, we know that uh, INPH is, uh, can be a very problematic uh, uh, disease to make diagnose of and also to treat. So we are all very uh, eager to learn uh, the current understanding about this uh, insidious disease that can be treated. So uh, please, uh, Professor, could you start your talk? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ferretti. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to, to, to meet you. Uh, I really have chosen to um, present this subject because uh, in, in fact, uh, this is often a frustrating subject for, junior, for young neurosurgeons. Young neurosurgeons uh, are uh, tempted by the easy treatment of shunt placement looks to be very feasible thing. And the expectations are those which really challenge them afterwards. So uh, this is the reason actually why I wanted to just a little bit deal in depth about this kind of subject. I'm working really at GK University, but I had the privilege of joining uh, um, IPH group, uh, clinical and research, basic research group in Juntendo University, uh, Professor Miyajima and, uh, and Dr. Nakajima, who have been working in the last 15 to 20 years on the subject. So joining them for the last more than 10 years, it has been really a privilege to have an insight in the subject. Uh, with this kind of subject, uh, I think we have been dealing for the last, let us say, 60 years. And these 60 years have been starting with the definition at the time of Hakim and Adams in 65, in which what is the definition for them at those times? Normal opening CSF pressure, bigger ventricles, no etiological factor detectable, and the typical so-called triad, gate, cognitive, and urination disturbances. All right, that was looking perfectly well, as much as that was actually so blurred as margins that it was extremely difficult to define. Later on, we understood that the IMPH is a progressive neurological disorders, and a lot of further investigation will be needed 
to be able to uh, practically understand uh, is really this an IMPH in a differential diagnosis with some other conditions like, uh, let's say, acquired post not hemorrhage, post-infectious meningitis, uh, uh, or some congenital or familial etiological conditions too. So uh, let's say uh, secondary and idiopathic IMPH are the first line that has been defined. As such kind of, of, uh, of entity, I will not say disease, what we had was actually a fact that at those times putting shunts for all kinds of enlarged ventricles, treatment was discovered before any kind of uh, pathophysiological understanding. And uh, that has been continuing for all these years. Uh, this kind of uh, rather unusual approach uh, uh, has, been, has been generating a lot of investigations, um, as this is a pretty massively found uh, as prevalence disease. Different kind of hypotheses have been developed. Some of them are based on the vascular role or some other kind of phenomena. But I will say at present to be updating, I think the dominance is in the vascular role, which is related more with the compliance of the vessels. In fact, uh, with the advanced degeneration of the vascular wall, the compliance of the vessels is reduced. So that most probably is a factor that has no uh, sufficient energy given to the CSF, which is around them. Why? We have been investigating the role of the glymphatic system, um, an interstitial flow that exists in the brain. And uh, that lymphatic system actually is based on a flow from the peri-arterial spaces to the interstitial part, perivenous spaces, and the ventricular part. This kind of flow is, let us say, a drainage system, a cleaning system for the brain. Uh, let us suppose that this artery here is inside like a cuff of CSF and then into the cuff where it enters into the brain. And this is the interstitial uh, space of the brain. These are the pedicles of the, of the, of the astrocytes uh, uh, and feet and so on. So in this space, when the pulsating artery is not efficient, the flow is decreased. And then as a result, the cleaning most probably. Not to mention that also CBF and the blood-brain barrier will be damaged as a result. But thinking from the, let us say, the latest point of view, we know that the imperial, the impaired arterial compliance in the small vessel disease that exists are most probably, most probably I'm saying, the reason for the development of IMPH syndrome. And this uh, impaired arterial compliance lead to poor glymphatic flow, as I already tried to explain, and because the pump is not efficient, the artery, and uh, uh, definitely that will be also leading to impaired clearance of the toxic substances that appear from the brain. We know that toxic substances are constantly produced. Toxic substances are, have been well established in Alzheimer's disease, for instance. So. Uh, we know about uh, those phenomena already a little, <laughs> at least. <laughs> so uh, let us see what is, in fact, uh, the approach to the uh, clinical analysis, which we had for these many, many years. We accumulated a lot of clinical observation, pre post statement, had a lot of physiological param parameters recorded. We observed by imaging, by other methods, structural changes, neurophysiologically, neuropsychologically, we evaluate as much as possible. We evaluate the CSF dynamics, biological parameters as biomarkers, and also we try to refine the surgical methods. So what has been appearing through all these years? It has been appearing in North America, let us say one of the big centers accumulating such kind of information together with more or less cooperative work in Europe, and another center of gravity of the research or so the area has been uh, Japan. 
at the beginning only case series. Later on, we had some cohorts and case uh, control studies. In fact, until now, we didn't have much randomized studies obtained because uh, having uh, uh, um, practically randomized controlled uh, uh, cohorts has been extremely difficult because of many factors, uh, many organization, but also ethical. And we lack such kind of investigation. So the, uh, the practical understanding is that uh, we have to um, continue the treatment without understanding the mechanisms. Sorry. <clears throat> in the United States in 2015 have been issued some recommendation. This has been uh, considered a guideline uh, summary and uh, these guidelines question, uh, answer two main questions. Uh, when was the, the efficacy of ventricular shunting? Okay. That is a very, very straightforward question. But I think the more important and interesting question was, what are the reliable clinical and laboratory predictors for successful outcome? And uh, mm, uh, such kind of, uh, of uh, um, prediction and such kind of analysis um, has been attempted in this, uh, mm, let us say, guideline uh, uh, system, which was published. Uh, based on 36 more or less reliable articles for the period 86, 2013. And uh, we have to say that that is very, very doubtful in the sense of established diagnosis, and we will see why later on. Uh, this is because uh, in fact, uh, we have a diagnosis only when we shun the patient. And this was the, the main limitation, I will say, for all these kind of things. The diagnostic criteria were more or less defined at those times for the American group. And the post-surgical evaluation criteria most or were, most or were defined. Meanwhile, in Japan, we had several studies based on two trials when they were called symphony with the, the abbreviation. Symphony one and two, the second one finished about 2012, I will say, when we actually obtained the, the, the final result. And now is ongoing Symphony 3. But uh, um, as a result of these studies, we have first guidelines in 2004, which are emphasizing the importance of the top test for the preliminary diagnosis. On the second guidelines, the diagnostic flowchart has been revised in some imaging criteria as DASH have been emphasized clearly. And uh, very recently, about two years ago, uh, were um, published the guidelines of, of the third version, which are giving already a complete algorithm of diagnosis. And they are based on observations until beginning and mid of 2018-19, actually, the beginning of 2019. That is a, a very difficult task to summarize data because of the, as I mentioned, diagnosis and indications, standardizing surgical treatment. That is the important factor diagnosis, surgical treatment, and post-operative care, which if properly standardized can be used as a positive factor to improve outcome. However, many things work against uh, this kind of outcome to be standardized, inadequate indications, contraindications, complications, uh, particularly early post-operative complications, comorbidities, adverse events, and so on. So what we observe in the uh, cohorts after surgery is gradual deterioration, very slow in general. After a couple of years, we have obvious deterioration. So what was the impact of all this knowledge on the guidelines? Definitely the diagnosis was the big problem. Making uh, a proper understanding of the diagnosis was the main obstacle and it continued to be actually problematic because we had four levels of diagnosis in the algorithm of 2011. It was the possible MBH, which was just referred to the basic clinical data with some dilatation on the ventricles. And uh, 
<clears throat> then we had the possible with some MRI already information related maybe to specific data, lumbar puncture and so on to reach the probable NPH when we had practically normal pressure on the LP. Top test was recommended in some of the patients where we didn't have enough clinical evidence. And in those patients, it might have been repeated in some of them and so on. So this was the, I will say a little bit gray or blurred definition until reaching probable NPH where shunt, shunt surgery was recommended if successful, if shunt responsive, the patient was considered to be a definite MPH. It is a little bit more clear in our latest guidelines according to the 2020. So we have to have the so-called suspected IMPH, which is one symptom of gait urination and cognitive domains, and uh, no other etiology, uh, age over 60. In the American guidelines, it has been much earlier age, which was also creating a little bit of confusion. And the dilated ventricles should have indicated a Nevin index more than 0 0.3. So all that with the proper evaluation of gait and making a lumbar puncture or making a tap test if there was dash. And this, taps, and this tap test was positive and the CSF was normal, then we could proceed to shunt surgery. However, if the, te the tap test was not clear, not, not uh, positive, then repeated tap tests could, uh, could have been considered in or even another differential diagnosis. So the shunt system was inserted <coughs> after the level of probable IMPH to consider this patient a shunt responder and the real IMPH. So here is the problem. To have a def definite IMPH, we need a predictor. Otherwise, you, we have to operate the patient and only then understand if this is an IPH. So identifying predictors is the key issue of IMPH. That's why I, in fact, actually I selected the subject to be reviewed. What is the value of this? No, no need to emphasize it because we have relatively a lot of hidden mobility of IMPH. And uh, for instance, the Scandinavian studies are indicating a very high prevalence, about 1.5, even 2%, which is a pretty high uh, percentage. And the social impact is enormous. Patients are really in need of uh, having better, uh, let us say, even ethical understanding of what the shunting will be. And in some low and mid uh, income countries, the expensiveness of the shunts can be a problem. So what is the objective of my, my, my talk today? I will practically update the latest information that came out from uh, the um, latest guidelines. And uh, I, in fact, did uh, a review of what has been available, intending to summarize uh, some points that can be of practical value for the uh, future practice of uh, neurosurgeons. What in practically was done, a search with IMPH, outcome prediction, shunting, all these keywords were actually explored. 51 results were selected after the rigorous uh, look at the presence of information. The period was 2014 until 2022, until present time practically. And what we obtained after the exclusion of some kind of case reports, secondary MPH and so and so, low number of patients and accepting only cohort studies, case control studies, and everything should have been in English. So it is really broadly understand. These 51 publications were extracted as predictors. We classify the publication according to the accepted by the Lancet uh, and the standards of uh, the level of evidence of publications, uh, giving one start to only descriptive studies, two starts old cohort case control and cross-sectional. Cross-sectional practically we don't have because this is not a broad population study. And three starts to randomized and non-randomized big, really efficient trials, but that has been very few. 
practically. All of our uh, studies have been mainly two stars and only one star. What kind of predictor is expected? Clinical, naturally, sorry, clinical imaging, CSF dynamics, CSF biochemistry, neuropsychological, and some other whatever could have been picked up as significant. Well, the potential predictors, which we had in the clinical section, were focused mainly on the symptoms presence of the triad, the onset of symptoms, their duration, the age of the patient at onset, the comorbid disorders, and particularly each of the triad symptoms. What was the role of gait impairment, urinary urgency, incontinence, and cognitive impairment? Well, what we know already, and this has been confirmed, is that gait impairment is the dominant type of symptom that we find. That is, that is followed by the cognitive impairment in less by the urinary, I will say also some kind of uh, dysfunction because it is urgency, it is not directly incontinence, incontinence comes later and so on. So the worst symptom is usually gait. The cognitive impairment is mainly related to frontal lobe dysfunction with a different kind of spectrum uh, associated attention, uh, psychomotor speed, verbal fluency affected. So all these explored selectively needed to be evaluated in the most precise way. And what we have been exploring and using in the practical uh, uh, approach to, to the problem have been some tests. Description as magnetic gate and like this is important, but it is not able to give us at least some kind of clear qualitative or even semi-quantitative description. So these are the tests that we practically use for defining the gate impairment. This is the 10 meter, uh, 10 meter gate, uh, walking test, I will say. And uh, that is always some kind of motor task with walking which we are going to evaluate as quality over a certain period of time. Step breadth, how wide he's keeping the legs, length of the step, is able to do 360 turn, placement of the foot, is that proper or not? One of the popular tests is uh, the time up and go, TUG, and you will see it in many publications. And I think that is probably the most uh, efficient in quantitative assessment at the moment. Cognitive deficit is a more blurred area. Uh, we have, because we have different kind of projections, these are psychomotor slowing, impaired attention, concentration is also um, uh, deficient, gradually deficient. Uh, the precision of fine motor performance is very important. We, we have this kind of uh, fine movements with the hand clearly affected. We use that for testing, like let's say a pegboard test in which the patients are having to put some kind of uh, stylus into holes and so on. And this kind of, uh, of test might be pretty precise in defining the difference with other kind of conditions. Short-term memory impairment is definitely there, but it should not be dominant because we have other conditions in which memory deficit deficiency is dominant. We have to make a semi-quantitative, as I mentioned, assessment of all that. What are the most common evaluation scales? Well, the INPH grading scale, which has been used in Japan for a long time for these previous symphony studies. It is a little bit uh, rough in estimation. Each of the uh, domains is having four levels, uh, actually five if considering normal, and this will give a common score. Now, how much the difference in urinary incontinence and gait disturbance is having the same value for the progress of disease can be questionable. So attempts have been made to make a more efficient assessment of the um, uh, you know, functional deficit that the patient have. So this is the Hellstrom uh, uh, symptom scale. Uh, he uses 
four domains actually, but gate is the most important, as I mentioned. So he's multiplying it by two and uh, stratifying in a different way, the different kind of domains. He is attempting a more precise expression of the severity of the disease. So uh, it has been used in, uh, in, 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 in a good number, particularly Scandinavian studies. Now let us talk about what has been found in the papers. The latest, this is 2020, 22, or, or the most recent in a certain domain. Severity of gait impairment, strong predictor of low quality of life. So the, if the patient is in a more severe condition with in his gait before surgery, that will predict a lower quality of life after that. The same refers to the gait dimension incontinence. And uh, and incontinence alone too. So severity is a negative predictor in general for the triad according to the latest studies. What refers to the other clinical characteristics, longer duration is also a negative predictor. Uh, particularly if there is any, any kind of comorbidity that has been obviously inducing worse results after shotting. The age of onset is progressing, has been also unfavorable. Elder patients, older age has been a negative predictor. So this is a summary. In general, negative outcome. This is what the latest studies, even after the latest guidelines are showing. They are confirming where we are. Now about comorbidities, let me just make at the beginning a differentiation. We have the general comorbidities, which are systemic or other kind of somatic diseases, and neurodegenerative comorbidity, which is often a serious problem when we are measuring differential diagnosis of uh, coexisting conditions with IMPH. So let us first talk about the general comorbidity because stroke, depression, vascular risk factors, vascular disease, and so on, all these conditions have been well explored in the cohorts that have been studied. And uh, the potential presence of stroke, the presence of overall depression scores high. Hypertension is a risk factor. From vascular risk factors, hypertension is the, the real, uh, the real uh, factor that uh, leads to lower um, uh, quality of outcome. Cerebrovascular and systemic vascular disease has been also such kind of factor. That has been also tried to be quantified or let better to say quantified. At the beginning was not relevant. It was not showing any correlation with the outcome. That is really a questionable point because this was attempted by Kiefer. And uh, at the later stage, about uh, starting, uh, about finishing the symphony one, the Kiefer uh, scale, which is here on the right side in, the, in its latest version, uh, has shown comorbidity, which is uh, that comorbidity can be a statistically significant factor of the quality of clinical outcome. So proper record of the coexisting comorbidity is extremely important to predict prognosis. Further on, uh, on the general comorbidity, to summarize, we have to say that the systemic vascular condition, particularly, and cerebrovascular disease, uh, in all its mm, presentations clinically, with including depression as a psychological uh, problem, we usually are observing a negative effect on outcome. Further on, let us go on imaging. There are I will say three important imaging criteria or three imaging uh, techniques of evaluation, to, to say better that, uh, which are uh, uh, associated with IMPH and have been long time used for evaluation. This is the Evan Index. I mentioned it already. That is the relationship between the ventricular width and the overall biggest brain or intercranial width. And that ratio should be over 0 0.3 or 0 0.13. That is a detail. The second point is the colossal angle. Colossal angle 
are the frontal horns here demonstrated. But actually, in fact, the proper colossal angle is at the level of the posterior commissure. So if we make a slice at the level of the posterior commissure, we have to establish what is the angle between the medial walls of the ventricle. That is more or less at the cella media level. And uh, this angle should be below 90 degrees, usually at with the presence of IMPH. There are two other uh, factors or criteria. They are again uh, uh, coefficients in one is the e, uh, the ZEI, uh, which is a relationship between ventricular and ventricle and mental. And more easy to apply is the BVR, the brain ventricular ratio, in which at the AC level should be about one and about 1.5 at the posterior commissure level. The anterior commissure is definitely more or less the same. Here we have this kind of two measurements that we are going to ventricular and mental uh, thickness or height, I would say, in the level of the two commissures. Now, uh, again, let us look at this kind of image. Ventricular, the colossal angle, very broad sylvan fissures, tightness of the sulci in the convexital area and the middle and the medial surface in the median surface. And we have the uh, uh, criteria to be uh, correlated with the outcome, either as separate ones or in conjunction. By looking in the latest publications, particularly about the Evans index, uh, there is clear evidence that Evans index is a, is a necessary factor. That is about better results with high level index and lower when the lower index is. The losal angle is also a positive predictor. Now, attempting some kind of semi quantitative approach. IMPH radiological scale is collecting the information about Evans this colloidal angle and some other parameters. And it had, did not show so obvious evidence that it is rel related to the outcome. So uh, in fact, uh, we have to mainly press to the main indexes or separate indexes. What refers to white matter periventricular lacunae or hypodensities, if they are not present, we have a more, uh, a better effect after the shunting. That is probably related to small vessel disease. And some other radiological predictors, which are very important. DASH. Well, DASH is, is a very important uh, part that has been at the basis of the uh, evolution of the Symphony 1 to Symphony 2, where DASH was so cardinal. Disproportionately enlarged subarachnoid spaces hydrocephalus DASH. And uh, apparently the presence of DASH is a very strong correlation. I'm again showing the expanded sulci below the cerebral fissure and then gradually getting tightening on the medial surface of the hemisphere and the high convexity. This kind of findings were attempted to be expanded by more precise volumetric analysis. And uh, it resulted to be uh, really also efficient. Now, how much more that reflects the morphology of IMPH, if there is any specifics, and there apparently there is with DASH, uh, we still cannot say, but this is actually much more time and effort consuming technique. Face, face contrast MRI is showing the movement of CSF in the ventricles and the aqueduct, and that is very helpful uh, for assessing the flow. In fact, uh, uh, that has not been really confirming the positive prediction. And maybe the most advanced things in the last year or so are the 
exploration of the so-called connectome or those uh, white matter connections that have been related to different kinds of uh, physiological, psychophysiological conditions like the task-oriented condition or mode of brain function or the default mode uh, functions, which are having specific networks. And the activation and, uh, and desactiv deactivation of these networks can be an indicator of what kind of pathology we have, in fact, and has been found some kind of relationship that particularly in, because this was done in patients with AD comorbidity, and probably that has some kind of relationship to the functional co uh, connectivity in the default mode network and hippocampus definitely is a, as, an, uh, as an Alzheimer. So that has been also related with higher tau, what means that we can probably detect comorbidity maybe with such kind of approach. But I'm giving it just as a methodology because sophistication of methodology is a tendency at present. So talking as a summary, in general, the standard and the currently developing predictors of, from neuroradiology are giving positive effect, having positive prediction on the outcome. Some CSF dynamics. So CSF dynamics that has been observed long time ago. External lumbar drainage has been used by MAMO for many, many years and published in 2005. And uh, patient improved gait after that predict, uh, predict was, was predicted a very good response to shunting by measuring CSF velocity, something that really can be considered with a little bit of reserves at the present. But in general, that stimulated further on development uh, uh, of the uh, CSF dynamics testing. Let us make a, a very clear the picture now here. What we do with the dynamic tests is simulate shunting. We have a lumbar tap, and we make like for a couple of hours or even more sometimes, it depends how much leaks after the, from the hole, a CSF, we will have shunting effect and so on and so on. There is just a little bit of detail in the compliance test, but I will mention them a little bit later. So we actually simulate shunting. And how do we simulate? The most simple is the tap test, 30, 30 cc of removal. And we observe after that within 40, 24 hours and maybe better for neuropsychological tests, we can do that later, but we have to check gate if there is any positive effect. The problem is that it has pretty high specificity, but low sensitivity. Well, uh, that means that we will detect the patients who, who will benefit, but the patients who did, did have a negative test may also benefit. So we are missing patients for shunting. And the ELD, the, exter uh, the external lumbar drainage, which is a uh, continuous drain, probably is a little bit more effective. So it has been showing, uh, clearly predicting positive outcome, as has been the TAP test. And that is, I will say, routine for all the, the units that are treating IMPH. Some other factors. ICP pulse wave, these are already more complex dynamics. This is associated with ICP recording. That is, to some extent, an invasive procedure that needs a little bit of time of presence of catheter, catheters indwelling, and uh, that can be combined with infusion tests. According to the ICP pulse uh, recording uh, in Barcelona, this was a study in Barcelona performed, it has been, it has been apparently uh, additional diagnostic value for efficient shunting. Uh, ICP monitoring was a little bit more controversial when it was combined with infusion tests. Still, I think, is not going to be in the center of gravity of decision making. And uh, a little bit about the dynamic tests, which are related with uh, the elastance and compliance, or uh, as they are mentioned as the route and coat tests. When we uh, apply certain volume into certain semi-closed um, 
cavity, it will increase in pressure. And because it is not completely closed, but is semi-closed because there is some kind of redistribution and drainage, it will gradually, the pressure will go down. How fast is going that? That is very important. Actually, what is doing the shunt? The shunt actually is reducing this kind of pressure as much as production of CSF is continued. So this is again a simulation of some kind of, uh, of the shunting effect. And uh, uh, performing this needs two needles. So one needle injecting and measuring, and it is invasive. It requires certain time. It needs a little bit of equipment to be standardized. Indefinitely, that increased the risks of its invasiveness. Not to say that it is not very comfortable to the patient. So this kind of approach is intending to be more precise in dynamics. Now, how efficient in the clinical practice, it is still to be really confirmed with much broader studies. This is a brief summary of the dynamic studies, which are showing like where are the sensitivity and specificity, they differ, they are having a little bit of differences, but this is a constantly changing approach. So all of them have a sensitivity, which is a little bit better and specificity, which might be interfering with the efficiency of selection. Now, with new coming investigation, all this kind of, uh, of uh, um, position of the different tests will be continuously changing. But low negative predictive value is the main issue. cycle, we have the, I would say the one of the major used at present is the UIMPH in the Junta and the group. There has been an extensive study which showed that it is very clear in detecting comorbidity with, uh, with uh, Alzheimer and even with the Parkinson spectrum. So it has been uh, a very, I would say, useful testing. Now, um, there are some more focused on executive function or in finger dexterity, even phonolo phonology, which is also some kind of dexterity. Uh, they are apparently uh, predictive of good outcome. Uh, that is another type of battery, which has been uh, recently developed, but more efficient considered to be more efficient with together with the external lumbar drain as a, an intervention to be predicted after that the shunt and apparently it can be used for but again i will say that neuropsychological predictors are not so robust compared to all other neuroradiological and csm dynamic ones uh, Uncertain and weak predicting power is what we have to say about that. Uh, new degenerative comorbidity detection is an important factor. That is, in fact, the coexistence of Alzheimer, Parkinson spectrum, or other kind of neurodegeneration together with the IMPH, although the initial manifestations are highly probable for IMPH. And uh, in a comorbid Alzheimer's disease study, uh, has been found that 26 of the participants uh, with IMPH had coexistent ID pathology. That does not mean that they will not improve after shunting, but after that is the problem. So uh, that is still a, a very important uh, part of our investigations with a lot of uncertainty. Uh, here are some of the predictors, or I will say CSA biochemistry predictors, markers, biological markers that we can use. Definitely those which are related to the, with the brain waste, or let us say what we have been studying in, in Alzheimer, AB42, uh, A-beta and uh, mm, hyperphosphorylated tau are very commonly investigated in CSF, and that can be really helpful for the long-term prognosis. Total tau 2 neurofilaments, uh, um, um, leucine-rich glycoprotein, PTPRQ, and CSF DRA transferrin has been used in the last time, even in the group of Juntendo has been attempted, has not been still fully established in the protocol of management. Just a few comments about that. 
we have a low tau A beta ratio in one very clear study, which predicts a better outcome. Lower P tau is very important. And again, P tau below 30 picograms, I think, are clearly predictive of less chance of Alzheimer's comorbidity. The same refers to the A beta 42, which can be used, particularly the toxic conformers or oligomers, because several uh, macromolecules of A beta are uh, accumulating. Those are really apparently a good predictor for the outcome. Levels are low in these cases. This is what we can say about the markers. Low predicting diagnostic value, but contributing to comorbidity detection. And let me say, this is not about the short-term prognosis after shunting. This is about the long-term prognosis after shunting, where the comorbidity will emerge. Few additional investigation, normalized power variance. That is an EEG analysis, computerized analysis which was able to identify responders, not yet with, let us say, enough strong power to compete with the main predictors, but he's having a pretty good perspective. And the second, also very uncertain, was the cerebral blood flow. Cerebral blood flow is not so specific, and we cannot expect the CBF can be really predicting at this stage uh, much about the diagnosis and outcome of shunting. Where there is a, a completely computerized approach and uh, just input of numerous factors which have been committed to uh, total analysis of probability and this kind of disease state index is one of the factors, one of the methods which are created for um, computerized diagnosis. It has been to some extent efficient not conclusive at all. So we have to operate the patient, whatever we have predicted. And how we are going to, those which are with probable IMPH, we have to do. I mean, I will say we have to use a shunt type after evaluating definitely the, the, the medical social background and if the patient is will be compliant and the patient will be definitely efficient after being shunted to um, uh, Definitely, we need to apply one of the shunting methods. So what we are going to apply at present, VP, LP, VA, ventricular peritoneal, lumbar peritoneal, ventricular arterial. Uh, the best will be to place a programmable valve or to avoid some kind of over drainage to put an anti-siphon device. Or now we have the gravitational valve also. And with this century, then we are going to monitor the patients, preferably closely in the first days because of the of over damage uh, uh, in the first few days, and then about the outcome at one, three, six, and twelve months. What has been characteristic in Japan for, for the last uh, period of time? In the Symphony One group, which was 26 centers, two patient randomized, we had mainly ventricular peritoneal shunts. In the Lumbo, uh, in the Symphony 2, which was the next study, which finished in 2012-13, Lumbo peritoneal shunt percentage has increased dramatically to 60%. I will say that now it is about probably 70 or 80% already. Lumbo peritoneal shunt is dominant. So the tendencies in, as a result of these studies have been changing about the surgical technique. The surgical technique may have some, inf, uh, some investigation, but Symphony 2 was, was clear that uh, LP shunt is not inferior to the VP shunt as outcome. Using other techniques, VA shunting or um, some kind of uh, other techniques might not be showing any benefits additional to what we know from the other techniques. Unless there are contraindications, certainly, because we may have indication for the other techniques. And we have the influence of shunter vision and delayed surgery. Shunter visions are obvious, but delayed surgery is something that we have to know. If we delay the placement of shunt, outcome is not so good. So what we have is really intention to place the shunt once we are convinced that we have probable 
IMPH. Uh, there was a very good study uh, which was ligating the shunt and then was uh, uh, removing the ligation. It was actually controlling in this way. This was a controlled study to see if there was positive effect of the shunt according to the time of shunting. So it was obvious that early shunting is more beneficial. After the shunt, just a few words. If the patient is having any symptoms, they can be either over drainage or under drainage. Over drainage is probably more common. And we have to set immediately the, to stop the over drainage, to set the valve at higher pressure. Or if the patient is not having anti-siphon device to place it and keep observing. And maybe after stabilizing, gradually decrease the pressure of the valve. If there is any subdural hematoma, and there, they are actually symptomatic, we have to treat it. And then again, go with the high pressure and uh, gradually adjust it to the patient. Under drainage, either the shunt is obstructed or actually the patient needs to be decreased the uh, pressure setting of the valve. We can check the obstruction with just maybe even tapping the the reservoir injecting contrast, we can immediately check. If there is no obstruction, we have just to reduce the pressure to get efficiency. Well, where are we now with the MPH? We are <laughs> somewhere, I will say, I will compare it to this old uh, uh, story of the six blind men who are touching an elephant and they know, um, they don't know exactly what they are, but they have their own opinion, each of them. And we are like the, those six neuroscientists which are exploring uh, either arterial compliance or lymphatic dysfunction or whatever. I mean, I suppose that if these six men go together and every one of them expresses their opinion and try to work together and touch together the same place, they may get a different opinion. <laughs> so where are we now? What are the logical perspectives? The logical perspectives are future non-invasive criteria. That is what we are having to look for. Which patients are justified for shunting? Next will be what can be the most appropriate simulation of shunting. Which of the tests we have to apply should be the least invasive and the least daily life affecting. And is one test enough or not? But finally, we have to aim at the extending the positive effect of shunting as long as possible. So this is what we can alter or just put as logical perspectives and questions on our current algorithm. And on this current algorithm, we will have to see also which are the trends. We have several trends which are absolutely clear. We have gradual uh, refining of imaging criteria. We have a gradual refining of CSF dynamic criteria. Neuropsychology is expanding its methodology and it is more precise, although not still so efficient, but it is more precise. And more and more biomarkers appear from what we are investigating, mainly from CSF. What refers to the treatment, the aim is probably one, at present, that is to be less invasive. And to finish my talk today, um, just continuing on less invasiveness, I have chosen this paper, which uh, is just a few months ago. And this is from the Journal of Neuro um, Interventional Surgery by uh, Dr. Lilik, who is the, the person who invented the uh, flow diverter uh, for aneurysms. And, uh, he placed a shunt, he placed a shunt in the, here is in the inferior petrosal sinus, and this patient is not with IMPH, but I mean, probably he was, he was slightly hypertensive, definitely. And with the size of the ventricles within two days, decreased. And what was device? Device was really, really amazingly small. Uh, it is placed via IV navigation with interventional technique, and once entering into, uh, uh, let's say, borderline area between the venous spaces and 
the, the subarachnoid spaces. This device is placed with one side from the, on the CSF and the other on the venous side. Placement is, is endovenous, navigational. The drainage will be from the CSF side down to the venous system. And very simple technique, very simple technique and small. I hope this will be inspiring you, giving you some kind of uh, imagination and probably will induce more creativity. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Cargioso, for this very complete uh, uh, overview uh, on this very complex disease. Uh, I think uh, for sure your talk uh, has been inspiring for, uh, for many young neurosurgeons uh, and also not for young neurosurgeons actually, because this disease is a problem uh, also for uh, experienced neurosurgeons. Although uh, the management of these patients uh, is often left to young neurosurgeons and residents, uh, right? So this is the paradox of uh, INPH. Uh, so, Ben, do you think we can open discussion now or after the second talk? Yes, maybe we can open the uh, discussion now. Good. And uh, yes. So, uh, if there are questions, uh, I, I can start uh, with uh, uh, one comment and one question, if, if I can. So, uh, the first uh, is a consideration about uh, uh, the, uh, the theology. Uh, of uh, IMPH, uh, you mentioned about uh, the glymphatic system that actually looks like uh, the converging point uh, for many different diseases, uh, not just uh, INPH, but also uh, Alzheimer's disease, uh, for example, or also brain edema after brain trauma and many others. So uh, it's interesting that this uh, looks like uh, the key point uh, to explain uh, many different diseases, but uh, actually the diseases are different. So it, it's very, uh, it will be a, a challenge for the near future to understand how the same uh, dysfunction of the same uh, uh, um, system, the lymphatic system, can lead to so different diseases. And the question is actually about uh, uh, diagnosis of IMPH. Uh, we know, and you showed us, that the TAP test uh, has a high uh, positive uh, predictive value, but a low negative predictive value. And uh, also other uh, prognostic factors have the same problem. So quite high positive predictive value, but low negative predictive value. So how do you, in your daily practice, uh, uh, select patients, uh, or better, how do you exclude patients from treatment if we know that we don't have a good method with a, a high negative predictive value? This is, I think, the key point uh, really? for managing these patients. Uh, and I would like to know if anyone tried to, you know, uh, combine the many factors you showed us today to find a negative, a high negative predictive model to exclude patients from treatment? Uh, thank you for that question. I, I, I certainly agree that, that this is the, 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 the key question. Uh, the TAP test by itself is uh, able to leave a big number of patients who potentially can benefit from the IMPH. In such cases, usually the TAP test can be repeated. Now, uh, definitely the TAP test is combined with the presence of uh, other factors, and particularly the imaging factors. If the patient is having DASH and the patient is having um, all the, some other, I mean, imaging criteria, that will be in favor of placing a shunt. Uh, so there is no very clear margin in which says uh, this positive, that negative, we will not do anything. I mean, it is a stepwise process in which we accept certain number of patients and then by adding tests, we add some additional but much smaller number of patients and so on and so on. 
And finally, there is a point in which we can reach the patient and uh, his or her family and ask, okay, uh, we have a relative probability, which is very low, but there is such a probability. If you would like to perform uh, a shunting procedure. But again, I'm saying we are simulating shunting with our uh, CSF dynamic study. So placing um, an ELD probably, placing an ELD is maybe the most uh, of those tests conclusive for the moment, for the moment. An approach with computerized, as that's why I include it at the end. We can make a mosaic of all the factors that can be detected in one patient and in, in a group of patients and try to make a computerized model in which combining predictability of this uh, all uh, number of tests, which, which combination or let us say how much any combination will be uh, predicting correctly. <laughs> For, I don't know the reason, most, most probably lack of numbers, but there was no evidence of any kind from such kind of computerized approach. So at the moment, we are still, I will say like those people beside the elephant in which before we understand what exactly is the reason of IMPH, we might not be efficient in the decision-making to the end in the same way like we are making a decision in many other neurosurgical conditions. Uh, also comment of the lymphatic system is, <laughs> I completely agree with your comment. Uh, it is definitely like that because uh, the lymphatic system is having many roles, but in this case probably is, is like the sewage system. <laughs> so as the sewage system, <laughs> it is taking away many substances that are, uh, are, are, are have to be cleared and that clearance is a very important uh, uh, point. Probably in Alzheimer's, there is a, a similar, a similar uh, event. Now, uh, where, what is the difference exactly? We don't know. I think that the shunt is having influence on the uh, arterial compliance because that is the pump, most probably. And uh, if we lose the pump, why we have IMPH? Why, in some cases, we have Alzheimer, but do we really have a vascular component in Alzheimer? That still remains blurred. But I think we have to we have to keep on working on this. Before we have the mechanism, we will not have a specific test that will tell you this we have to operate, that we cannot. Thank you very much. Thank you very uh, much. I would like to uh, involve also the discussants, uh, uh, Professor Alexander Wozniak and Professor Abida Shah in this discussion. Uh, but we have three raised hands uh, now. Uh, so, Dr. Kapil, maybe first one. Uh, unmute I'm not your... sure. I have to leave. I've just reached. Yeah. Oh, yes, Abida. Uh, hi, Kapil, hi. wait a moment and then unmute. Abida, please. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so that was a very fantastic talk, Professor Kostadin, and a very good overview of high, uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus. So if in this current age, if you have a patient, would you prefer a LP shunt or a VP shunt? Well, uh, as you understand, uh, uh, we have uh, contraindications and indications for each of the techniques. VP shunt is a little more invasive there is a little bit of risk of cerebral bleeding during the ventricular puncture. Uh, definitely the patient will have to be accepting an intervention on the head. Lumboperitoneal shunt is much easier to be performed. In elder patients, we can do it under local anesthesia even with some sedation. We don't need the general anesthesia like the VP. And uh, I will say that we need a good spine. I mean, a spine which is compliant with the good flow of CSF through the whole segments of the spine. And we have to do an MRI of the spine before that to confirm that there is no compression or any impediment of the, of the CSF flow. Now, obese patients, very obese particularly, 
do not tolerate well LP shunts. Uh, slim people, in general, except the sumo wrestlers in Japan, Japan, uh, um, the elder people are not uh, obese. They tolerate here the LP shunts pretty well. So looking at these specific contraindications, we have to look at. Not to talk about the, uh, the, uh, the peritoneal cavity. The peritoneal cavity, for some reason, has been, let us say, involved in some previous surgeries, peritonitis, adhesions, whatever. We have to be cautious in general in putting a patient, and we have to resort maybe to VA or other kind of solution. So these are the details in the, in the decision making. Uh, once the conditions are similar and explaining the patient, the patient even can interfere with the decision if he is extremely decided on one of the sides. But in general, LP is much more preferred. It's less invasive. That uh, is what I, I can I say. I see many, many questions accumulating. So uh, Kapil, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Very good evening, Professor. And uh, on this, uh, actually, I would like to know, sir, I have always have a doubt when the cases of NPH with the elderly patient comes. There is a, on the imaging, there are the either uh, extra ventricular hydrocephalus. How we should get differentiate with this term? Means these features on the MRI and what will be the probable line of management in those patients? Uh, I hope I, my doubt is clear. Uh, you got my doubt. And, I, I, I couldn't understand what you mean. You mean uh, uh, what kind of hydrocephalus? Because in general, in general, the uh, mm, uh, the uh, sub the cortical uh, area is with very wide sulci, and particularly the symphion fissures are very wide in patients yes. uh, with IMPH. Uh, that is the, the typical appearance. There are some some of them are not so, but that is the typical appearance and. Uh, uh, do you mean that, uh, or you need just an extra cerebral CSF accumulation in which the there is that a subarachnoid or subdural uh, effusion? I, I'm, yes. I'm not very sure so I, I, your I, question. Yeah, please, I please mean repeat extra it. Please. Ventricular, yeah, I mean it. The extra ventricular hydrocephalus means there other features of the defining features of normal pressure hydrocephalus are not there on imaging studies but uh -huh. patient have a symptoms like dementia for that mm -hmm. should we change our line of management that you just now deliver uh, you explain you mean, us about you mean uh, there is no dash or no any uh, or let us say there is no may, the evans index is marginal i think yes, i think in those cases uh, the best is to follow the csf dynamic tests CSF dynamic tests will be will be important, and to keep on even a second dynamic test and so on until we are completely sure that uh, this is not a patient to whom the drainage of CSF can be beneficial. Yes, sir. yes. Sir. Thank you. And uh, Thank you. following the rule, women first. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Sneha to uh, ask uh, her question. Very welcome. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, Professor, for that amazing, amazing lecture. And uh, it was almost uh, the entire research of INPH summarized in your talk. Thank you very much. And that was my intention, about... really, to update. <laughs> yeah. And also, the, uh, uh, you literally uh, concluded with a revelation about the interventional uh, shunt. So thank you for that information. Uh, my question will be uh, about INPH in uh, Parkinson patients. <sighs> No, because I, I kind of felt that that was not discussed. So I would like to know your uh, comments on it. Because we in our center, we have shunted quite a few Parkinson patients with uh, INPH features. And we found that they did uh, do well, although it is only exactly. in the early six months to one year period. And then? And, yes. And, and, and there are studies saying about the uh, delayed uh, uh, decline in improvement or no improvement at all. But what would be your thoughts on giving them a chance at shunting? Well, uh, what I would say is that comorbidity is not a contraindication for shunting. Hmm. If we have a suspicious comorbidity, we can investigate. That's that's why I dedicated some portion to the tumor uh, to the biological markers. The biomarkers can hint us about Alzheimer particularly because this is the most frequent. But after that, Parkinson's disease and Parkinson's spectrum, whatever it is, I mean. 
supranuclear palsy or uh, cortical basal degeneration, whatever it is. I mean, but a Parkinson's disease by itself, uh, it, it can have the elements of, uh, of, uh, of IMPH. And if the patient is benefiting from the top test, probably, probably we can discuss the, the intervention. And he might benefit for the initial period, usually six months, one year, or one year and a half, but less than two years in general, in which he will be um, actually in starting to be dominant the Parkinson syndrome. Okay, so uh, next uh, is Dr. Burani. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, very nice talk. <clears throat> as uh, I'm neurosurgeon here in the Netherlands, as you know, the senility and aging, there are more and more patients and there's an assertion that um, uh, in all the uh, Alzheimer or other cognitive disorders, Parkinson's, as Nia told, there should be some component of normal pressure hydrocephalus. Uh, and there is uh, just to justify to put or to do some uh, diagnosis and put some kind of shunt, in this case, a patient, for example, or maybe is the, the innovation of Lelic uh, just to, uh, to put a small uh, 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 system to help these people at least to rule out uh, if there is some INPE. What is your uh, opinion about that? Well, Thank you. It, it, I, will, I will continue probably on the same subject as I was talking on the previous. Uh, we, our CSF dynamic tests are, we have to take them as a simulation of a placing of shunt. A lumbar drainage is a lumboperitoneal shunt for let us say for 24 hours or 36 hours, as long as you keep it. So this kind of, of uh, test, I think can be very important, even if we have some other characteristics of disease, which are not exactly matching the IMPH syndrome. We should not have just the triad and anything else. Now, if we have very obvious presence of comorbidity, like let us say very high p tau in the CSF when we did the diagnostics, that will mean that uh, we have to expect deterioration relatively early. But I'm, I'm again saying if, if CSF dynamics shows that probably shunt will be helpful, we can discuss it in that limited indications or that limited approach to the problem because Comorbidity of IMPH with the other ma major neurodegenerative diseases is the reality, is the reality. For instance, Alzheimer, I showed you a study which is about, let's say a few, a few years ago, 26%. It's a big number. Thank you. And next is Dr. Anyaku. Dr. Anyaku. Thank you so much, sir, for the opportunity to contribute in this discussion. Thank you, Prof. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir, for, the, for this presentation. Wonderful indeed, as uh, taking me through the normal pressure hydrocephalus. Yes, so the earlier contributors have actually delved into some of my questions. I appreciate your contribution on the place of ventricular peritoneal shunts and lumbar peritoneal shunts. Yes, certainly uh, in a good number. In your discussion, you made us know that the use of lumboperitoneal shunt is increasing. Dr. Anyaku, I'm not hearing you very well. It is interrupted yeah, for some reason. In, I think Dr. Anyaku has connection problems. In a Sorry, are you hearing me, sir? Now, now we can it's hear you. It's breaking from time to time. I'm sorry for that. Oh, hey, so sorry, sir. Sorry, sir, are you hearing me now? Yes, yes, now, yes. Okay, sir. Okay. So, in your in your practice, how do you how often or commonly do you involve the neurologists in the evaluation of the patients with normal pressure hydrocephalus? Thank you so much, sir. 
Yes, thank you very much for the question. I, I think that is important. In the team of Juntendo, with Miyajima Sensei, Nakajima Sensei, and so and so, we have a group in which there are neurologists, psychiatrists, basic science researchers, and all that team regularly makes scientific meetings and clinical meetings are done between the clinical members on a regular basis. So the patients who are reaching the point of shunting has been have been discussed on several steps, but the outpatient itself is able to perform the new psychological tests too. And in that way, they go into the department. They are admitted for a day just for the tap test or for the drainage test. So all this sequence of events is organized with the active participations of neurologists and psychiatrists. Okay, uh, Ben. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. But ben, can you unmute yourself? We cannot hear you. Uh, yes, sorry. Uh, thank you, Professor. And uh, this is a very important uh, lecture to the wireless memory. It's a very common condition that we face uh, uh, in our daily practice. And your your lecture is uh, very uh, educational and a really quick review of it. So I have just a quick question. So uh, uh, in our daily practice, we usually use a tap test. But uh, uh, what is your opinion towards the saline infusion test? So is, is there st still a role of uh, it or is mainly for research purposes? Thank you so much, Professor. Yep. Well, uh, I have shown uh, some slides which were comparing uh, the tap test and external lumbar drainage test with uh, the infusion test or the compliance uh, um, exploring tests, which are practically uh, intending to see what will be the pressure rise related to the injection of certain volume. And that is uh, elastance or compliance, or as they are in these tests, they are the so-called uh, um, route and thought. So uh, the ability of the uh, CNS volumes of CSF to compensate certain additional volume is a very important factor, how much shunt will be affected. If these volumes do not compensate easily, shunt will be helpful. If they accept this, let us say, CC of injection, it's all right. That means even if we shunt, situation will not change much. As that's why I was saying that we are simulating shunts. Now, the uh, elastance and compliance are making practically uh, a little bit uh, uh, probably physically and physiologically more precise evaluation. But from clinical point of view, they are more difficult to perform. They require longer time. Sometimes they require two needles to be placed. Uh, there was one study in which was playing before a V patient was placing an ICP monitor. And this kind of, <coughs> and this kind of investigations are probably a little bit more invasive than the standard tap test in the, uh, the external, uh, the external uh, uh, lumbar drain. So uh, I will say that uh, at this point, the simple tests are dominating. The uh, route and the cult are not yet established as a routine. Although some centers are using them, but I'm not sure they are giving much advantage at this point. Maybe, maybe, if a simple tap test is not efficient, can be test, can be tested another type of compliance test, but that we still don't have it as a study. Thank so, you so much. Yeah, we are in a little bit gray area that has to be investigated as maybe you might be able to do that. 
Thank you, Professor. I think uh, uh, we, time is flying very fast. We have time for uh, the last I'm two sorry, questions. I'm sorry, I was talking too long, but... No, no, not your fault. Uh, probably it's the opposite. Your talk was so interesting for many people. So, Sachin, uh, you have a question. I, yes, thank you very much. Dr. Alberto, am I audible? Yes, yes, please. Yes, you are. Yes. Thank you very much, Professor Kalsadin, for the wonderful lecture. I'll quickly ask the question, what is your opinion about ventricular atrial shunt? Because I had an opportunity to listen to one of the uh, neurosurgeons from Japan, who probably had one of the largest series of ventricular atrial shunt for normal pressure hydrocephalus, yes. and who was claiming that that's the best shunt that's come to ventricular meritoneal and lumbopatial shunt. So what's your opinion on that? Yes. Uh, I mean... Ventricular atrial shunt is not having any superiority to the other two shunts, uh, as much as has been investigated, but has not invest been investigated in that rigorous way with higher um, evidence as have been compared lumboperitoneal and ventricular peritoneal shunt. So this is one of the points in which I mentioned one study with uh, ventricular atrial shunts, which was apparently being efficient, efficient in the standard way without any evidence of superiority or inferiority. Now, the non-preference to say of the VA shunt is, is, is the complications that are, can be related. Um, in fact, uh, uh, well, definitely in the long term, there is a, a shunting nephritis, but uh, that is not, I, I will not say that this is so much in the, it is more or less the revisions and the other kind of things that can be a little bit more cumbersome. So uh, in, in general terms, um, it is a solution for, in, in general terms, I will say, for those who are not having proper good indications for lumboperitoneal or ventricular peritoneal shunt. So I feel it still as the third alternative. Thank you, thank you, Paul. Thank you. And last question, uh, Dr. Pirzat. Hello. Uh, <coughs> Konnichiwa. Konnichiwa. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, I'm Dr. Pawad Pirzat from Afghanistan. And uh, thank you. Uh, it was great and excellent uh, lecture and presentation. And it was so helpful and academic uh, uh, learning purpose as well. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, we, we are facing uh, uh, in Afghanistan uh, with uh, sometimes when case of uh, complicated uh, ventricular peritoneal shunt for in pH like infection. And uh, what, what's the another option if we are facing with uh, complicated uh, shunts? Well, uh, if, a, if a shunt gets infected, I think it has to be replaced and the, and the infection treated. Uh, a patient with uh, infected lumboperitoneal shunt in, uh, in an IPH patient uh, will have to be um, uh, done a replacement. And if the reason is some kind of, of long lasting infection or some infection that will impede the further placement of shunt has to be found alternative uh, solution. I mean, if there is peritonitis or there has been too much adhesion in the peritoneum and there has been a repeated failure in the peritoneal part of the shunt, then we go atrial. There is no other way. Or if uh, the lumbar spine uh, has got, I mean, for some reasons, the only option after ventricular has to be attempted that. Now, um, the only option is uh, replacement. I mean, we have to replace it. There are some shunts. I don't know if they, that will be available in, uh, in Afghanistan as uh, the antibiotic impregnated shunts, which uh, are having less probability of, uh, of, of uh, getting infected. And also some technical issues about the placement. I mean, we have to avoid any contact with, uh, with uh, any subcutaneous layers, which can definitely transmit infections. We have to place uh, the shunt in a way that it will be not, trauma not traumatized tissue and induce necrosis and eventually, I mean, has to be placed in the proper way, well protected from any penetrating infection. So these are points which I think you are following in your, your surgical practice. Much. 
Oh, thank yeah. you, Arigato. And other uh, question is about the selection of type of uh, shunt. And uh, uh, in our market, it's only mid pressure shunt is available. And uh, uh, do you uh, recommend a specific uh, shunt for uh, iron pitch or? We use this mid pressure. Yeah, that is it. That is it. That is an issue. I mean, shunts cost money. Unfortunately, shunts cost money. And uh, I mean, Codman uh, uh, Codman shunts uh, with programmable shunts and uh, Mitke uh, shunts have been used uh, in 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 Gentendo. Uh, to them has been added. Uh, um, uh, anti-siphon device in the past and also gravitational valve also to avoid the post-operative uh, over drainage particularly, which is much more frequent. Now, in your situation, uh, the patient with ventricular peritoneal shunt uh, is uh, somehow uh, uh, needs some kind of valve that is should be permitting to be high pressure at the beginning and then gradually to be decreased. If you don't have a programmable valve, that is a very, very difficult task, how to regulate pressure. In general, uh, it started from high pressure and it is going down little by little. This is to avoid any subdural effusions and particularly the cumbersome um, over drainage, which is with headaches, nausea, and all the symptoms of, of over drainage, I will not mention. So with the medium medium pressure, uh, that might be associated with some kind of over drainage in some patients. Um, I really uh, don't have any solution except you give any add-ons to the valve and try to add some kind of anti siphon device or, or other kind of device that will prevent over drainage when the patient is standing, when the hydrostatic pressure is is uh, really high. Thank you. Arigato. No, no and, way, unfortunately. Thank you, thank you thank for you. you. And uh, thank, thank you for you. Professor Yoko Kato. Also, uh, <coughs> he promised to send a uh, uh, chance for Afghanistan. And uh, I, I would like to say thank you for Professor Yoko Kato. And uh, we are still waiting for how to deliver us to Afghanistan. And uh, we hope someday we have programmable shanta as well in Afghanistan. Thank you very much. Arigato. You're welcome. Thank Arigato you, very Professor much. Kato. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Caragioso, for this. Uh, thank you. Work. Thank you, Dr. Right. Thank very, you very, very much. Interesting discussion. Uh, thanks to all the uh, people who asked questions. Uh, ben, uh, do you think we can move on with the next uh, speaker? Yes. yes. Please uh, proceed. Uh, uh, yes, please proceed. Yeah, uh, so uh, the next speaker is Dr. Anne Mansour. Uh, she is a PGY4 resident uh, in neurosurgery and also a PhD student, at University Health Network, uh, Department of uh, Laboratory Medicine and Pathobiology uh, at the University of Toronto, Canada. Uh, Dr. Mansour will talk about uh, minimally invasive techniques for detecting somatic mutations uh, in vascular malformations and their targeted therapeutic options. So Anne, you can start your talk, please. Uh, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Perfect. Yes. Excellent. So uh, thank you all, especially uh, Professor Kato and the organizing committee uh, for uh, inviting me to present today our work in the uh, AVM care. So my talk, as you mentioned, will focus on uh, the understanding of molecular biology of vascular malformations and how we use this information um, from a, a laboratory perspective, but translating that to target oral therapeutics in, uh, in the AVM treatment. So in the next 20, uh, 15 to 20 minutes, I will highlight the types of mutations and their pathways involved in the development of familial as well as sporadic vascular malformations. I will touch upon the historical targeted therapeutic options for these lesions, and then we'll move on to the more recent findings in AVMs. Um, lastly, I'll showcase our pilot data on targeted therapy in AVMs before finishing off with some more novel techniques in, in detecting mutational burden in a more minimally invasive manner. Okay, 
So to begin, as many of you might already know, vascular anomalies are defects that occur during vascular development that cause abnormal vessels. So we can break this down into both vascular malformations as well as tumors. Uh, today, I will focus mostly on the vascular malformations, so I won't be speaking about vascular tumors, but vascular malformations consist, as you know, of venous, lymphatic, arteriovenous, and capillary malformations. Most of these lesions, though, are present at birth, but there can be de novo lesions that occur throughout development. They are either caused by inherited germline mutations, so these are mutations that occur um, that you can pass on to generations, but more commonly, as many of you know, they come um, because of somatic mutations that occur after conception. In, in both of these cases, the mutations that occur are actually in major cellular pathways that include the PI3K mTOR pathway or the rasmec erk pathway. Together, these are well-known pathways that they respond to a stimulus. The stimulus is something like a growth factor, for example. And through a series of activations, they govern important functions. And these functions include cellular growth, proliferation, survival, and cellular motility. These pathways are also occur in a variety of cancers, uh, and with this knowledge, we have targeted therapeutics that were first applied to these pathways in the oncology um, population. So to our knowledge right now, the molecular biology involved in vascular malformations started off with our knowledge on familial cases. We know about 11 specific types of vascular malformations that occur due to inherited germline mutations. These are the mutations that are passed on um, from generation to generation. These mutations are typically inherited in an autosomal dominant pattern with a heterozygous loss of function mutation. And then what happens is throughout development, there's a second mutational hit and that results in a complete loss of, of protein function, which results in the more severe phenotype. The more well-known vascular malformation diseases with inherited germline mutations with, uh, are uh, hereditary hemorrhagic telecdectasia, so HHT, and capillary malformation AVM syndrome, or C, uh, CMAVM syndrome. In HHT, we have several loci that are linked to the disease, but majority are linked to BMP signaling, which when it is in the wild type state, it activates um, various uh, transcription factors that are supposed to, and generally they're supposed to suppress the endothelial cell migration and proliferation. So it keeps it in a quiet state. However, when we have a mutation in this, it disinhibits it. So it, basically what it results in is an abnormally enhanced uh, endothelial cell proliferation, migration, and angiogenesis. And the same thing kind of happens in the CM, CMAVM syndrome, where you have the RAS pathway, where, which is normally quiescent, so normally quiet, but because of... Um, um, uh, a mutation, you have a disinhibition in this. So the early studies on targeted therapeutics used in inhibitors of the PIK3CA pathway for both HHT, as well as Avastin, which uh, inhibits the VEGF ligand in stimulating both pathways. There was some partial response to each of these drugs, which confirmed the role of these pathways in their pathogenesis. And that ignited more research into the driving force behind um, the, the more common sporadic lesions that we see in clinical practice. And so that's the PIK3CA pathway, and that's the mTOR um, um, uh, serolimus, which is the um, uh, drug that's used for the um, PIK3CA pathway. And bevacizumab is uh, Avastin, as you know. So the somatic mutations often occur after conception and are not inherited. They are significantly more common than germline mutations, and they consist of a gain-of-function mutation um, that causes a, an abnormal protein and phenotype. These occur both in slow flow uh, as well as high flow lesions, but today they'll be focusing on both the venous, lymphatic, and AVM physiology. We won't be talking about Sturge Weber uh, or capillary malformations today. So both venous and lymphatic um, uh, malformations are caused by a gain of function mutation in, in the TEC receptor tyrosine kinase or the immediate downstream effector called PIK3CA. So knowing this, there are actually trials in PIK3CA and mTOR inhibitor, which I showed you earlier called serolimus or rapamycin, and they've been conducted with decent response in both the venous and lymphatic malformations. Um, apologies, sorry. So as you can see here, so this is a clinical example from a recent paper in 2021. And what you can see here is that this is an example of a pediatric patient with a lymphatic submandibular lesion that responded after five months. And you can see again, after 11 months of serolimus, and what happened is essentially this is a patient that went from being palliative to now being facilitated just for surgery um, because of the, such a significant reduction uh, in the volume and size of the lesion from um, an oral medication serolimus. 
So the initial impetus then for AVM care was to target the most upstream actors in these pathways, including the VEGF molecule, its receptor tyrosine chirates, and then inhibit the inflammatory response that occurs as a result of this pathways activation. Altogether, the aim was to st stabilize the vessel wall. So uh, right here, I, I um, summarize a few of the more uh, recent and important trials. So the trials assessed the tetracycline derivatives, derivatives, unfortunately did not yield a clinical response, which bevacizumab, or again, Avastin, showed some serum reduction in, Ve in VEGF, but ultimately there was no phenotypic changes. So patients did not have any noticeable change in their AVM volume or um, uh, importantly, any change in their phenotype. The most recent paper by uh, the group in Belgium did show a good response to thalidomide. Um, so many of you uh, remember uh, thalidomide um, uh, in its past, but it's been applied for AVMs and they actually have better safety outcomes when they apply at a lower dose. So this work predates the more recent finding um, actually from our group that the, of a specific pathway driving AVM development. And this is the rasmec erc signaling pathway. Uh, and that's this one I'm going to be focusing on because that's the, um, the focus of my PhD. So our group found that the overwhelming majority of sporadic AVMs actually harbor an activating KRAS mutation that are specific to the endothelial cell. This mutation then causes increased um, phosphorylation and uh, abnormal cellular morphology and androgenesis, which were reversed in uh, with an inhibitor of the downstream effector of the pathway called a MEK inhibitor. So this is a drug that's given um, uh, that reverses the aberrant pathology. These abnormal phenotypes, including AV shunts, sprouting, and hemorrhage, were again reversed with the MEK inhibitor in preclinical studies. And these are studies that are done by our group and our, our collaborators on both mice and zebrafish. So how do we translate that into the clinical world? So trametinib is actually a, an already available drug by the company Novartis, and it's a MEK1 and 2 inhibitor that was brought to market and actually approved for KRAS-derived oncological stage, such as metastatic melanoma and non-small cell lung cancer. So patients in these populations had few serious adverse events, so it's a safe drug. And ultimately, in the oncology population, they had a greater improvement in progression-free survival at, uh, compared to chemotherapy alone. So knowing that, patients with sporadic AVMs share the same path of biology with the KRAS mutation, an idea was to apply trametinib to patients with severe AVMs. So there were case reports, and I show you here case reports from 2019 to 2021, um, on palliative pediatric patients with thoracic wall AVMs um, that showed good response to trametinib as opposed to the mTOR inhibitor serolimus within just six months of daily use. And then they have um, quantitative the amount of uh, reduction in the blood flow to the lesion and overall cardiac output. And so one of the patients, actually the patient um, uh, from the 2019 group, also had an intramedullary component of the AVM um, that responded to MEK inhibitor well. So this is an example of both an extracranial as well as uh, partly CNS involvement of an AVM that both of them responded to um, uh, to this to this drug. So. Again, while this might seem like a busy slide, it effectively summarizes what we know to date with the inherited mutations in blue and then the somatic ones in red alongside their oral targeted therapeutics. So we now want to focus on the safety and efficacy of trametinib for uh, adult patients in AVMs because I've only shown you the pediatric population so far. Um, so this kind of goes into what my uh, work is uh, and my uh, PhD um, focus with Dr. Radovanovich at Toronto Western Hospital um, in Toronto. So we have several se uh, se centers associated with the University of Toronto that have high flow of AVM patients and expertise in both the management of these patients as well as both the delivery and, and of trametinib. So with this in mind, we decided to embark on two studies to assess the safety and efficacy of trametinib. So one is a prospective um, observational study of adult patients with palliative AVMs. So these are about roughly 20 patients that we're aiming for that are receiving the drug already for clinical use. And then the second group here is a pilot phase one study focusing on safety. So the safety is the primary outcome of trametinib in patients with unruptured, you know, uh, elective surgical AVMs um, at one of our centers. So we, from this, we anticipate so the administration of daily oral trametinib will be well tolerated with similar, if not better, safety profile compared to the oncological populations, and that the drug will offer a 
positive effect on the patient's symptomatology, mor avian morphology, and ar angioarchitecture. And so this will be this work will be the first of its kind for AVM care and hopefully can drive future clinical trials. So at our center, we developed a contract with the company Novartis and allows for us to administer the drug to patients with palliative AVMs under compassionate use. So these patients take, it's an oral medication, it's about two milligrams daily dose, and they're followed up monthly to assess for any side effects that might warrant treatment, conservative treatments or dose modifications. They're also followed clinically to see the change in the AVM size and appearance and symptoms, as well as um, change in AVM volume and ar angio architecture on, san on scans. And we, we follow patients for a total of six months while they're on the drug to look at the um, endpoints we just discussed. So I want to show you right now um, our first patient, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, this is our first patient was a 56 year old female who had a right facial AVM that progressed over the years despite multiple targeted embolizations. She had significant pain and deformity associated with this lesion. And since it infiltrated her ear, as you can see in image D, um, she had reduced hearing on that side. So she, at this point in time, she's exhausted all of her conventional treatments. So she was um, deemed a candidate for initiating trametinib at two milligram daily dose. So what you can see um, between images C to E and then D to F is that within just six months of daily use, she had significant reduction in the size, redness, and pain associated with the AVM. Similarly, there was a reduced infiltration of her ear that facilitated improved hearing on that side. Um, what I show on the right side of the, of the screen is that you can see on her imaging that there's a reduction in the size of the nidus and decreased arterial vessel diameter and periangiogenesis after six months of taking the drug. So these effects were also sustained um, 18 months after taking the medication with no serious adverse events. So she went similar to what I've shown you from the pediatric population is that she went from being palliative to now actually having such a great response to the medication that she, she's being scheduled for elective surgery um, to resect the AVM with a curative intent. So we have several other patients like her. I think right now uh, I have a total of about 10 to 11 patients who have started or are planning to start the medication within the month. So this is the palliative cohort. And then our second study is a more formal um, pilot phase one study that looks at primarily safety in, in this population. So the plan is to enroll adult patients with unruptured AVMs who are planning to undergo sur elective surgery for resection within two to three months. The patients take the drug for two, two months, uh, and then we look at uh, the same safety clinical and imaging endpoints right before the surgery. And at the time of the surgery, we take a specimen of the AVM to our lab. And that what, what that allows us to do is to, we can look on, um, to see at the molecular level, what are the changes that happen that drive these clinical um, uh, responses. So we hope that this trial will get us one step closer to not only understanding the biological disease of AVM, but equally importantly, but expanding our therapeutic options to oral medications with um, um, targeted uh, therapies for patients. So again, clearly a lot of known mutations and major cellular pathways are involved in, in, in various types of vascular malformations. And I know that this talk um, might seem very much like a, a research or uh, a talk that's focused on laboratory medicine, but it, it really in the last, I would say five years has been such a translational um, uh, piece of work that uh, many uh, centers are growing in their, um, in their ability to, to offer oral medications for vascular malformations of all kinds. And so this is why I really wanted to focus on this today because it's it's the up and coming uh, option for patients and um, something that we can consider in the next in the next decade. So the challenge that many of these patients have though are that the lesions are in critical areas. So a biopsy, it, it may be quite invasive to determine what kind of mutation that they have. So the, the next little bit of my presentation is to, to uh, determine whether we can detect these mutation in a quick and minimally invasive manner to then um, stratify these patients for um, uh, various targeted oral therapies. So in the past couple of years, there have been isolated case reports on two techniques to achieve the same. One is called a liquid biopsy. So that is done in the oncology world as well, whereby cell-free DNA is extracted from plasma. So you, they take patient's blood and they spin it, you get the plasma and you can detect the mutations. And this is widely used in oncology where there's a lot of circulating tumor DNA that can be extracted from a peripheral blood draw and then tested for the presence of mutations. 
However, in AVMs, the amount of cell free DNA is much lower. And by the time it gets to you know, the peripheral vein, it is below the level of detection. So instead, um, groups in, in America and Italy have proposed collecting blood from the actual lesion at the time of an angiogram or embolization where there is a greater abundance of, muta of mutant cells. So we've been trying to validate this technique and using um, PCRs, so polymerous chain reaction, we were able to try to detect the somatic variants in each type of malformation. So AVM, venous, and lymphatic. And then what's shown below is a slightly more invasive approach that is to place a coil intimate to the wall of the nidal vessel. And this coil now is essentially coated with mutant gen gen genomic DNA. Then what happens is you take the coil out and that we have all those precious mutant cells around. We isolate the DNA from um, the coating around the coil and we can look for mutations in those cells. So both of these are ideas that are very, very early in their infancy, but they might be promising detecting mutations from just a blood sample that can then tell you whether your patient is uh, a candidate for oral therapeutics. So I, I know I've talked quite a bit of a, a variety of different um, uh, research as well as clinical uh, options today. And I've shown you an overview of molecular biology of vasculations and how this knowledge should not just remain in the lab, but I think more importantly, it can be used to clinically drive precision medicine. I've highlighted some of uh, our ongoing work to date, which have um, not progressed without the support of various individuals. So I would like to thank Dr. Rad Ivanovich, who is my supervisor, as well as members of my lab, uh, members of the clinical trial, as well as clinicians that are local and abroad or part of each aspect of the work I've presented today. And I also would like to thank you all for the privilege to present and, and for your time. And of course, I, I'll open again up to questions. Thank you, Dr. Mansour, for this very interesting talk. Uh, it's always very fascinating to hear about uh, uh, basic science research uh, that can be actually applied in clinical practice. So we can open discussion for this uh, uh, talk. Well, I, I have a question, uh, maybe a comment and a question for about your talk. Um, uh, I am very much interested in not only in vascular malformations, but also in uh, um, the Fonipel Lindau disease uh, for different reasons. Uh, and I feel like uh, there are some, uh, you know, uh, common features uh, among uh, VHL disease and vascular malformations, although um, Fonipel Lindau disease uh, is considered a, an, an oncological disease, not a vascular disease. But in fact, uh, the the basis of the disease uh, uh, is vascular, is uh, an impairment of angiogenesis and uh, like um, impairments of uh, molecules like VEGF receptors uh, uh, or uh, um, cellular pathways like the mTOR pathway are uh, similarly involved uh, in this disease. So I would like to know if uh, you have any idea about uh, uh, such kind of research uh, applied also to uh, oncological uh, diseases like uh, Fonipel Lindau disease. I mean, do you think uh, uh, we can find something in common uh, between vascular malformations and this kind of uh, vascular-based diseases. I'm asking this question because you showed uh, very interesting uh, trials, but as you know, for uh, Fonipel Lindau disease, uh, all the attempts uh, uh, to find a drug or, uh, you know, molecules uh, failed for uh, uh, brain hemangioblastomas, uh, for hem uh, CS uh, CNS uh, hemangioblastomas, uh, uh, which is in contrast with, for example, uh, retinal angiomatosis, which can get benefit from uh, drugs like bevacizumab. Right. Thank you so much. I think that's a great question. And I think part of it, you've, you've alluded already to the um, lack of, you know, RCT or level high level data for, for that disease for targeted therapeutics. Certainly, I think there's been a um, a focus on bevacizumab, generally speaking, in um, various oncological populations, including VHL. Um, I think the short answer to that is that it's not been effective vast and on its own for VHL. Um, there are case reports, certainly, of um, serolimus, so that's mTOR inhibitor for VHL. I think, realistically, in what we're seeing for both 
VHL as well as AVMs and other kind of vascular malformations that a, a solo approach with one targeted therapeutic is insufficient. And it's insufficient because it's not just that one pathway is activated. It's just there, there are multiple pathways that are activated and they also talk to each other. And so if you really only target one, oftentimes what happens is you still have other pathways that are still upregulated. So for example, both the KRAS and the mTOR um, pathways are, are activated. So you know, I think what we'll be seeing is that in the future, we will be seeing a combinatorial approach where people are taking, for example, a Vastin plus a Sirolimus, and then that enhances the response. And we do see in the preclinical, so in work done on mice, for example, and on zebrafish, that when the drugs are given together, that there's actually a synergistic effect. And so we have not yet seen data on, on human patients um, and either VHL or ABMs for the combined approach. I think it's just because it's very early in research time, but I do suspect that that's kind of where things are heading. And in, in oncology world, for example, of um, metastatic melanoma or non-small cell lung cancer, already the marketed drug is a combined therapeutic. And I think they've learned that already. And I, I think we're just a little bit slower uh, uh, on some of the other diseases to get there. But uh, hopefully if I'm invited five years from now to give this presentation, I'll have a little bit more of an update on that. <laughs> Thank you very much. So in your opinion, it's more like a problem of uh, uh, different pathways uh, that can yes. uh, like uh, get involved if one is uh, blocked uh, rather yes. than uh, a problem of drug delivery uh, because of I the so. brain barrier. Hmm. I okay. think so, yeah. Thank you very much. I see uh, there are uh, some raised hands. Uh, Dilshot. Uh, hello. <clears throat> nice to see you again. Hello, Dilshot. Uh, uh, thank you for an uh, interesting presentation. Um, I have a question about uh, uh, first, uh, uh, have you any clinical uh, trial or uh, laboratory trial, uh, the use of uh, uh, the drugs you have shown, like bevacizumab and, uh, and the trematan or uh, these drugs in the, in the treatment of uh, cerebral AVMs, because I have seen the, the presentation of mostly facial uh, hemangiomas and other vascular malformations of the face and skin. And, and do you have any uh, clinical trials with the uh, intracranial uh, vascular malformations uh, targeted therapy? Yes. Yes, uh, I think that's a great question. So the the trial that I showed earlier for, um, for Avastin was for intracranial. Again, did not show any changes in the phenotype or size of the AVM or anything like that. It was just all they saw was reduction in the serum VEGF. So basically what that showed is that Avastin works like it's supposed to. It target, targets VEGF, but doesn't do very much anything on its own for AVMs. For trametinib, what is reported to date, aside from that one patient that had um, like an intramedullary component, so technically CNS, of course, there's no reported literature yet on brain AVMs. Having said that, our group is doing that. So I'm very excited because my PhD work, um, because I have the two um, uh, projects on the palliative cohort, I told you that I think I've enrolled now about 10 or 11 patients. Two of those are severe palliative brain AVMs. So we will be able to see from, I mean, they just enrolled, so they just started receiving the medication this month. So I don't yet have any data to tell you exactly their response, but uh, I imagine the next six months, I'll be able to comment on that. Um, we of course know that the brain um, environment is different than extracranially. So uh, whether that facilitates or hinders, we don't yet know, but there's really no data to show, to kind of um, say anything about that yet, but we will uh, show that. And then for the surgical pilot um, uh, data, that, um, sorry, surgical pilot trial, the actual trial that we're going to do, it includes AVMs anywhere in the body, including intracranial AVM. So that will be the first of its kind. There is a group in Belgium that's doing an AVM trametinib trial for Europe, um, but they're only doing extracranial at this time. 
Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Ben. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Manchu, for your presentation. And nice to meet you again. So it's a very um, inspirational uh, research work. So um, I, uh, I have uh, two questions. The first question is that uh, from your palliative uh, cohort side, uh, uh, have you uh, looked into the uh, the predictors of a uh, response to traumatic nip. So uh, why do the patient uh, has the response? You look into uh, the patient's uh, genetic. And my second question is, uh, is about the technique of uh, getting the tissue sampling by the endovascular mean. So um, is, is, there a, uh, is there an obvious uh, difference uh, from the, uh, of, the uh, of your samples compared to the peripheral blood? Uh, have uh, do you uh, compare it uh, with the peripheral, but uh, with uh, in your studies? Can you uh, elaborate uh, elaborate slightly more on that? Thank you. For sure. So to answer your first questions about um, determining response from the clinical side, so for the palliative cohort, we did not require patients to deter to prove that they have the mutation because. We knew that the overwhelming, so over 95% of patients with the sporadic AVMs actually have this mutation. So we assumed that they had it. Um, in terms of who responded, who didn't right now, it's still very early for, for us to tell since people are just starting uh, the medication. I guess I would imagine over time, maybe if you ask me this question in the future, I think part of it has to do with, you know, um, the location. So I'm curious to know, this is to kind of piggyback on the previous question, whether, you know, does do extracranial AVMs respond better than, facial, than intracranial ones or not? I don't know yet. I think patient's age is another one. So the reason why the literature to date is only on pediatric, it makes sense because they're in a time where, you know, they're, um, the AVM is growing very quickly. So in puberty, for example. And so I think they're in that volatile age where they're most likely to respond to the drug. And so I'm not surprised they have such a good result in that. I imagine what happens, and we've shown this in the clinical and the research side is that the brain, especially, but other parts of the body become more quiescent in the adult population. So with that in mind, there might be a little bit more of a muted response or less of a dramatic response uh, in the in the adult population compared to you know a, a teenager, for example. But I think it's too early to tell what kind of predictors. Now, what I think will be interesting is from our surgical trial is that we will be getting tissue to kind of look at at the lab. And so I think from that perspective, we will be able to see more of like maybe molecular markers of responders and not responders. Um, and I think that's really more important because the AVM population in itself is so heterogeneous from a clinical standpoint, um, that I think we would need very huge numbers to really determine from a, you know, clinical side who responds and who doesn't. But if you know from a molecular side, I think it's a little bit more um, uh, straightforward. And then I think you asked about, uh, oh, the second question is uh, uh, whether we have differences from peripheral blood. So for these patients, what we do, so let's say for an AVM, we get blood peripherally, so that's from a, uh, we ask anesthesia to give us a blood sample peripherally, and we get blood from an arterial pedicle and we get blood from a venous side. So these are patients that are often getting a transvenous approach for embolization or something like that. The mutations always sit on the venous side, always. So every single time we get a peripheral blood draw, it's negative. And we know that it's basically a negative control. On the arterial side, we just did it to prove that the mutation is not on that side. Again, negative. Then we see the mutations that are when, only when we get samples from the venous side. And we're just struggling right now that what I'm trying to work on is to try to increase the um, proportion of cells that show the mutation. It's nothing about the cells themselves, it's about the technique to try to make it to, so we can detect it easier in these patients. But um, it's, it's always gonna be on the venous side. So that's just a hint. Thank you so much and congratulations on your result. Thank you. Thank you. I see Arion. You also have a question. Yes. I, I, good morning, Anne, here in Toronto, and uh, good evening good to everyone else on the East 
Well, there is never east and west on this globe, but a wonderful talk. Thank you so very much for sharing your experience. And um, let me start by wishing you all the best with your studies. It's a, it's a heavy load you are taking on both graduate and then the residency. I, I, I see hope out of your work to a disease that uh, for, for most of us, when it goes to higher degrees, when, when we use um, Spester Martin grading, we see that might as well call it a malignant behavioral clinically, although it's not a malignant tumor, but that's how it behaves. And mm -hmm. the clinical future of the patient is always at stake. I'll start with the technical question. And then if I have uh, the, the opportunity, I'll have a second question that's, that's more scientifically oriented. So the technical point is that you would need, you would always need a uh, interventionalist uh, uh, physician to help you collect the samples. On that end, are you cooperating with distant um, colleagues? What I mean by distant is that uh, are to a certain degree far from your center. And uh, would you be able to accept samples from them or you have uh, already closed the collection of data and you are working with what you have? So um, this is for the liquid biopsy study? Yes. Yeah. No, for sure, we're, the, we're currently in, a, I would say, infancy of that um, study. We started locally. We've expanded um, still, I guess, uh, overall locally, it's still Toronto, but other hospitals. Um, there are uh, limitations right now in terms of how we analyze it. So from a technical standpoint, the major challenge, and I think I've briefly alluded to this in the previous question, is, the, is that we're getting the mutations. That pro we can detect that the mutations are there but they're in such a low fractional abundance that they're almost at a borderline that can be considered a false positive. And so we're trying to figure out how do we increase the abundance of this so that it actually, you know, is, you know, um, accurate and can be um, a reflective of true pathology. We've tried in our latest samples uh, to collaborate with a lab that does this on a routine basis for oncology, and they have a different kind of protocol than what we use. So, they were um, encouraging us to spin the blood within two hours of the time of the angiogram. And then usually what happens is the blood is, is kept in a tube that makes it viable for maximum 14 days. But usually the encouragement again is to run the analysis within the first few days after the um, uh, procurement of the blood. So from that perspective, of course, for myself, it means I'm you know, very active going to all the angiograms and doing it immediately. If that actually increases our yield, I can see how that would be a, a limitation to collaborating, you know, across seas, for example, because it means we would need to get the sample quite immediately, or at least within the first few days after the procedure. But uh, I think it'll take a little bit of time for us to determine whether the time is an actual true and uh, significant factor, because if it's not, the product monograph for the tubes means that they can, there should be technically viable for 14 days. So uh, I certainly think I will uh, work on that because if we can increase our numbers uh, and collaborate, that would certainly be beneficial for everybody. Yes, now I see that it's, it's, there are different layers of difficulties that uh, apply to the model that you are working. So, and, and one of those would be to have uh, in in place lab that's currently working on some sort of basic research wherever you would have them collect the samples for you. But uh, one other, that, might, that would be my final question. Have you been able to uh, observe, see, or be curious to find out uh, with time those somatic mutations persist, do uh, express their self differently, remain the same within within the population that you are studying, or within two groups of populations, those have uh, change, significant changes that might be considered down the pipe for different treatment approaches. And by that, I mean, you are studying and collecting data from the group of Dr. Peter Dix at SickKids, if I'm correct, I saw his name on your on your on your presentation, and then it's going to be Dr. Radovanovic from the adult population. Mm -hmm. So both ants have data collected from somatic mutations, which are the majority of cases. It's not that you mm -hmm. want to do that, but these are the bulk of your cases. And within the two populations, are there uh, 
common denominators or there are major changes that exist? So there are major changes that exist, but they're not at the level of just detect. So at the detection of a mutation, it's the same mutation. And regardless of whether you give it drug therapy or whatnot, the mutation is still going to be there. It's not that we remove the mutation. Um, it's more so the microenvironment and the epigenetic changes that happen that are different between a pediatric population and an adult population. And so we sit, we uh, our labs have collaborated and work on more single cell kind of analyses. And we've recently been working to put together a molecular atlas of AVMs as well as other um, um, disease and entities. And we include both pediatric and adult populations. So we do see that number one, the uh, microenvironment is different uh, for uh, brain as well as other parts of the body. And that's well understood, but that the pediatric versus adult also have different upregulated and downregulated genes and pathways, uh, even if they have the same disease entity, such as AVM. And so from that in and itself tells us that, you know, that is why I mentioned that there might be a differential response or a different kind of response from a pediatric population, from an adult population. We know that the brain is more quiescent as it ages. And so after the puberty uh, ends, we have the endothelial cells are quite quiescent um, uh, compared to, you know, very young as well as a, um, kind of a adolescent time point. And so, you know, when I initially started my work on trametinib and the oral therapies, people said, you know, all the work that's been done today has been on the pediatric population. Do you think patients will have the same response? I said, I don't think patients will have the same response, but I don't know in what way it's going to go. Um, our first patient that I showed you there, she was, I think, 56 or almost 60 years old. Luckily, she had such a great response. But I think that if on average, if we were going to look at 100 patients that are in the pediatric or adolescent group and 100 patients that are in the adult group, I certainly think you'll have more patients that will respond well to therapies such as trametinib in the pediatric group. And I think that's just reflective of the fact that their molecular biology, and it's not the somatic mutation, it's more the epigenetic changes in the kind of um, uh, uh, modifications that happen higher level that are different in a pediatric population. So it just makes them more likely to respond and, and just a little bit more of a volatile um, uh, patient group uh, from a molecular point of view, if that makes sense. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yep. Thank you. Thank you so, so very much. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, I see Dr. Burani. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, very nice talk, uh, Anne Mansur. Uh, just um, remind me, our old neurosurgeon, he told us, uh, make sure or uh, that you would be unnecessary in the future as a neurosurgeon. It means he was uh, just uh, uh, looking to non-invasive uh, non uh, treatment methods Good idea, of course. Um, if you look to the genetics and other developments, what is your thoughts about the prenatal uh, treatment, intrauterine, uh, in this case for cranial IVMs? Are there uh, some uh, developments? Because Toronto is our best center what uh, IVMs is treatment uh, concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think you're a little bit ahead of the time there. Um, I, there's nothing yet done uh, on prenatal for prevention, at least, of ABM. Drugs like, sadly, <laughs> drugs like trametinib are contraindicated in pregnancy because the major side effect is um, they're teratogenic. So uh, unfortunately, we cannot give these medications to pregnant women. Um, I certainly think gene therapy might be something to be to consider in kind of the, the work of prenatal, because that's, that's where the mutations happen. It's not that their patients are, have that at germ, like it's very different. Germline, just 5% of the AVM cohort have that. 95% is sporadic and the mutation usually occurs before, after conception, but before birth. So it's exactly the time that you're referring to. Um, probably, I think the answer to your question, hopefully will come from Toronto, but uh, I think in the next maybe 10 to 20 years, uh, if I can spearhead that, I will. Uh, but for now, it's uh, nothing's been done on that yet, but good idea. 
so we can still be neurosurgeons uh, for yeah. our That's good. <laughs> good to know. Yeah, uh, raise his hand. Yes, Professor Bosniak. Uh, please unmute. Thank yes. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mansour. Thank you very much for very nice presentation, for very accurate work, and con and my congratulations. Uh, I have a question. I have a question concerning the patients. Um, how long clinical effect uh, do you expect that the patient you presented, and how do you see the uh, their follow up? after finishing of uh, the stage of uh, your investigation? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, that's a great question. Um, so right now, we, as I said, we just started with the traumatic therapy, so we don't yet have longitudinal response, but I can anticipate what the answer to that question is. So in the mTOR inhibitor, so sirolimus group, rapamycin or sirolimus, when used for venous malformations, if you stop the medication, uh, what happens is there's a large percentage of the patients over a third will have a recurrence of their symptoms or recurrence of the growth of their vascular malformation. So effectively what that means is that they need to be on it for life or until it bridges them to another therapy. I think it's going to be the same thing for trametinib. In preclinical studies, it's like that. Um, in the patient that I showed, that one with the intramedullary component, it's the same patient that actually had two different case reports. But um, And what was reported between the two case reports is the patient had a drug holiday, so stopped the medication for a little bit. And that was the only time that's ever been described in AVM that the, the AVM started to grow again while the patient was off the medication. And this is the problem with any of these um, oral therapies. What... So I think I've had, I've given a similar presentation before and somebody had asked me, you know, what is the role or what do you see the role of these drugs realistically in AVM care? And I think there are two, two roles and this kind of comes up to, to your question. The first is I think, you know, for patients for symptomatic management of palliative AVMs, I think, you know, there are no other options. I think that certainly they can be on this drug if provided they can tolerate the adverse events, they can be on this drug kind of indefinitely. But I think the second group of patients in this is are patients that like the first one I showed you that are such great responders, or maybe you are on the edge of, of let's say, being considered for, for surgery. So high spots are more, for example, if we could use the drug to shrink the AVM sufficient amount to allow it for an, either surgery or embolization. So in that case, there is a means to an end. The patient has the treatment and then no longer requires the oral therapy afterwards because there's a cure. And so from that point of view, of course, if the patient stops the drug in that circumstance, it doesn't matter because there's a cure. So uh, it's more challenging for those who are palliative and maybe have a partial response or not enough to really facilitate other treatments. I think those patients will have to be on it to some degree indefinitely. Um, and I think time will tell how long if uh, the, the results will persist. Our patient was on it for 18 months. Um, and the, the results have persisted. And I think her surgery is scheduled for January, February. So um, from that point of view, at least we know the results persist that long. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I think that uh, this method or this will uh, have their place in the complex treatment of uh, this pathology, so, like so. in different oncology uh, pathologies. So thank you and uh, congratulations uh, once more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So Ben, I give you the floor, you and Professor Kato for uh, final remarks. Yes, yes thank thank you. You. So I invite oh. Professor Kato to give the final <laughs> remark first. And then uh, I'll see if uh, Dr. Sachin have any announcement to make. Uh, Professor Cato, please. Okay, okay, thanks. So that we had a, a very good lecture from the two, uh, uh, excellent talk. So the, uh, Anne, uh, thank you very much for your very nice uh, uh, the talk, uh, basic, uh, based on the, the very basic thing. Just I want to ask uh, the, in the future as a clinician, so can we, uh, can, can you predict the uh, maybe some uh, uh, the rupture of the AVM in the future, that is one. And also, the, can you uh, predict or a suppression of the AVM in the enlargement 
you know, the final one is uh, in the future. So the, with uh, your uh, methodology or drug, uh, can we stop the, the AVM surgery in the future? It's a three very short question. <laughs> Um, thank you very much, Professor Castle. So uh, to answer your first question, I think in terms of preventing rupture, um, what we know from the preclinical work is that the, the way the drug works is that it actually helps to prevent or work on diminishing AV shunts. And so we know that shunting is actually the primary driver of, of the pathology, particularly for predicting, you know, hemorrhage. So when we look, you know, typically if you look at a scan and the patient no longer has the shunt, then you think there's a cure. So uh, from that perspective, I do think that the drug will alter the actual natural history of the disease. So um, I think that's very exciting. What, uh, to answer your second question of whether it will uh, eliminate or reduce the need for surgery, well, as a surgeon, I hope not. <laughs> I think the, the goal really of, of the drug, I think for some patients is symptom management and potentially for very small uh, AVMs or those who are maybe, for example, who had radio surgery, and then there's a small remnant, you know, and we say, what do we do with that remnant? Maybe for that population, the drug might be useful to kind of get rid of that small remnant and they don't have to go for surgery for that group, or they may not need to, another round of radiosurgery. But then I see the uh, complete opposite end of the palliative group. So these are patients that we would never offer surgery for. But then you look at my patient who we've given the drug to. And now we're offering surgery. So I, I think we'll buy a whole group, or hopefully we'll offer more surgery for a whole group of patients. Um, uh, an increase the amount of surgery we're actually offering overall, um, but maybe uh, offering it to those who need it the most and who would benefit the most, as opposed to, let's say, those who have, let's say, a remnant or a uh, very tiny AVM that we might be able to cure uh, with the drug. So uh, hopefully we'll keep us all in business. <laughs> So my, anyway, my, my congratulations on your, uh, your research work. So I heard a lot from uh, Dr. Ivan about uh, your, uh, how nice you are. Thank you very much for a great talk. And also, thank you. Uh, Nicole Sadi, uh, thank you very much for your the great uh, the talk. Thank so you. I, I think my, uh, my you So NPH is a very common disease, but still, so we have so many uh, uh, we need to do further uh, research because of the uh, CSF dynamic is still uh, unknown, and and also and also the shunting system. Uh, I think uh, maybe we need more uh, in the research uh, in future because uh, at, at our institute the radiation is more frequent than mm. others. Yes, because more uh, the elder people uh, will be apply uh, need some uh, shunt uh, surgery. Some of them is a very similar lumbar uh, disease, so it's quite difficult to yeah. put the uh, elbow yeah, shunt. That is the contraindication, yeah. certainly. Yeah, and also the VA shunt is the shortest distance. So once you, uh, I think, uh, uh, if you learn, I think a VA shunt is not so complicated. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. I started. I started my career with VA shunts only. There were no LPs at those times. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Thank you very much. After, anyway, after yeah. X-ray placing the catheters into the mm. uh, vena cava. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much for your overview. Thank you very much. So we learned a lot from uh, from two of the great the uh, speakers. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Thank you very much. So uh, Albert. Thank you, Professor Cato. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, these comments uh, and thank you to the speakers today and also to the audience uh, because uh, we had a very active discussion uh, after each uh, uh, presentation. Uh, ben, uh, I give the floor to you. Okay, and uh, thank you so much. And uh, and uh, to tonight we have a very um, educational uh, lecture on NPIC, also a, a very uh, inspirational research work on uh, AVM. And uh, thank you so much uh, for all of you for joining uh, to tonight's uh, Wine and Nature. And, and I have no announcement to make. So uh, so uh, maybe I call this the end of uh, this uh, one as a uh, webinar. And uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And uh, for the today's uh, uh, webinar, uh, will be uh, broadcast. It was broadcast on uh, YouTube live, and also it will be available on uh, WeChat channel. So uh, I would like to uh, thank you all of you again for joining us uh, tonight.
And uh, Mr. Carlo, do you have any uh, final remarks or we end the session? I think maybe Dr. Liu, uh, can you uh, make an announcement to the next uh, webinar? Dr. Liu? So uh, Ma'am, the next webinar is supposed to be on the fourth Sunday. And the fourth Sunday is 25th of December. So that is a Christmas. So what do we do? <laughs> so maybe Dr. Liu will make an announcement in the future okay. by email. Okay. Yes. Okay. We'll decide that. Okay. Okay. Then. Yeah. Uh, drive. I, okay. Yeah, I, I will send off. Hello. Dr. Liu, please. Yeah, I, I will yeah, I will send off the, the hello. Hello, Professor. Hello, hello. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I shall I shall send <clears throat> send uh, hello 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 uh, yes uh, I I wish send the the flyer uh in the next few days we we have a uh, three uh, uh main speaker uh but uh, our main uh, our of uh, uh, the most uh, renowned speaker is uh, Professor uh, Kawase he will speak uh on Christmas Day Professor. <laughs> Okay, good. Okay. So, Dr. Ben, so that is his final comment. <laughs> Thank you so <laughs> much for the castle. And I think that's the end of the Rhinus. Uh, uh, webinar. So, uh, again, I would like to thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you so much. So, thank uh, you. Dr. Dr. Anne, all the best. Thank you so much thank for you. having me. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Ben, for taking over and helping me. No problem, Sachin. And a good trip. See you. See you.